Welcome to Besieged, a podcast about Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Apple, McDonald's, BP, Shell, ASOS, and Nespresso, as well as hundreds of other companies, are severing ties with Russia because of Putin's actions in Ukraine and because sanctions are making it difficult to continue doing business. But for those companies invested in Russia, unloading these toxic assets is a challenging affair. Earlier today, I spoke to Dr. Anna Grossman, a senior lecturer at the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Loughborough University, London. I asked her about toxic assets, as well as what would a world without Russian gas look like, and who are the oligarchs in charge of the country's biggest businesses? Okay, hi, Anna. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, Peter. Thank you for having me on today's podcast. I'm great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about who you are and your background and your area of expertise? I'm a senior lecturer in the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Loughborough University London. And in my research, I focus on contemporary state capitalism or the role the state can play in business. In a recent paper published in the Journal of International Business Studies, I looked at how governments can nudge other governments into their political or business strategies through the companies that they control, such as state-owned multinationals or sovereign wealth funds. And I also focus on Russia and you know, the Russian economy and the link that the Russian government has with the Russian businesses, um, you know, especially those businesses that are owned by oligarchs. So I've been, you know, um, following how the conflict, you know, between Russia and Ukraine has impacted the Russian economy, you know, through sanctions or through new government regulations that um, the Russian government has imposed on foreign businesses in Russia as a, as a result. I know you've written about toxic assets before, and it's, um, uh, it's a term that you, we've seen um, we've, we've seen a little bit in the news. Do you want to explain what a toxic asset is or what they are? Well, toxic assets are like nuclear waste. They're very hard to sell because in the current situation, it's very hard to find the buyers for those assets at appropriate prices at what these assets are worth. And these the assets are, are what? Are they shares? Are they uh, stakes in companies? Yes, absolutely. So they could be proper, you know, uh, functioning businesses, they could be operations, uh, you know, they could be essentially any kind of presence that these foreign companies have in Russia. For example, uh, BP has 19.75% um, stake in the Russian oil producer Rosneft, which is actually co-owned with the Russian government. And this has been, you know, one of the biggest toxic assets uh, with you know, a net worth of $14 billion that accounted about 30% of the total amount of oil that BP produces. So this is probably you know, the most uh, um, known case of a sale of a toxic assets um, um, that a forereign company owns in Russia. Uh, and so has, has BP sold those assets now? And did they get $14 billion? For no, them. no. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the negotiations are still ongoing. Okay. This is definitely not a straightforward sale. First of all, it's very hard to find a buyer for these assets because many companies are actually sanctioned from buying Russian assets at the moment. And second, it's very hard to find someone who would pay a price, which is at least, you know, the book price of these assets in the current environment. Everyone knows that what comes in the next few years is going to be very uncertain. So there's likely that a BP will have a you know huge markdown from that uh, fourteen billion dollars um, worth. Okay, uh, do you, I mean, is there a is there a, a figure of how much um, investment there is from abroad um, in Russian assets? How how much these toxic assets are worth in total? Well, you know, there are about. 400 multinationals that have decided to scale back, suspend operation or withdraw completely from Russia. So you can only imagine that um, there's probably around 500 US businesses operating in Russia and probably, you know, same amount of European businesses that are looking to scale back or withdraw. BP for sure is one of the largest uh, 
um, you know, assets, but these assets are worth billions. And uh, of course, the risk is that, you know, if companies decide to leave um, their assets, that they, they might be actually be taking over by um, temporarily by an administrator that would be sort of managing these assets. And then eventually these assets could be passed on to someone else um, with regards to the new um, Russian legislation. So, it, you know, we're talking about huge amount of money and it's really uncertain whether these companies are going to be able to see um, the assets if they sell them, for example, with an option to purchase them back. So some companies have decided to, you know, hold on to them temporarily, you know, reviewing their plans while trying to not be in breach of the sanctions. So it's a really hard situation at the moment. So, so there are so there are companies out there like like you mentioned BP who could potentially lose billions uh, and get nothing nothing for it if they're if they're taken by a, a third party. There are a number of companies that are already announcing that they are selling their assets to or transferring their operations to Russian businesses. So some of those companies had local trading partners such as Imperial Tobacco or British American Tobacco, but. A number of other companies are, you know, exploring ways that can disconnect them temporarily from Russia, but have a, an option to have a call option to repurchase these assets back from those trusted local partners. However, um, you know, other companies such as the international law bank firm Bacon McKinsey has decided to remain in Russia, but to become an independent law firm. So they have not uh, completely exited Russia, but they have restructured themselves on a new legal entity, which is independent from you know, the, the parent entity, but still kind of operating under the same brand. So the, the sale of assets is further complicated by the new proposed um, law uh, that would introduce, uh, potentially introduce a tax on the sale of assets by, um, if, if those assets are sold by non-residents of the Eurasian Economic Union, which makes the disposal of those toxic assets even more costly for companies, you know, such as companies originating from the UK or US. Can you tell me the, the impact that companies like McDonald's and Espresso and Nespresso um, are having by pulling out? Because um, I know that um, because Apple are not trading anymore, the remaining iPhones that are left in Russia are now phenomenal. The, the prices are huge and people just can't afford them. So for the for the average person, how is it affecting them? Well, um, yes, this is a great question. Uh, as a result of the sanctions, the economy is taking a huge toll and the sanctions have an enormous cost on household, as you mentioned. So the cost of all imported goods have increased by at least the inflation, which is up by 6%. The cost of cars, especially you know the premium cars, has increased by up to sixty percent. Even locally produced goods such as alcohol that depend on you know uh, global supply chains, increased by six percent. And uh, there could be maybe a slight decrease in locally produced goods and the cost of petrol, but it definitely does not you know um, compensate for the increase of the imported goods. Um, this is already felt by, by the Russian households. And, you know, in addition to that, if we look at uh, how many multinationals have decided to scale back to spend operation in Russia, I mean, there are around 400 multinationals and maybe more to come. There will be at least, you know, 2 million of employees affected, even though some companies like McDonald's have decided to, in spite of suspending the operations, have decided to still pay uh, their employees, but for how long, we're not sure. Yeah. So this will also have a huge um, effect on employment in the months to come. And what, what's it doing to, to the economy, the, the, the Russian stock market? Uh, well, they've closed it to um, foreign investors, haven't they? So the price, I think, is, has, got, has come back up from plummeting at the beginning of the war. But can you tell me a little bit about what is happening to it? Well, you know, the Russian government has issued um, a regulation that prevents essentially from uh, um, selling the, the local assets. So it's, it's really hard to, you know, even sell the assets at the moment. So the companies are in a kind of, a, you know, difficult situation because on the one hand, they have to comply with the sanctions. But on the other hand, you know, of course, the Russian government is trying to prevent 
you know, this negative impact on the Russian economies by, by doing, you know, these laws that are making harder for the uh, companies to leave their assets. And there is, of course, a, a risk that, um, you know, some, some companies just don't want to, to sell because they, they think that, you know, eventually their assets will end up in the um, hands of the Russian government. So, you know, there, there is, of course, a, a, a control on, you know, the, the Russian currency as well. The kind of the stabilization of ruble is, is essentially uh, due to the fact that um, Russian citizens are not allowed to withdraw um, rubles and convert them into, you know, any foreign currency. So this foreign exchange rate, you know, it, it's kind of artificial, you know, because it's, it's an interbank rate that came up, up back to what pretty much what it used to be pre-war, you know, at the um, end of February uh, 2022. But essentially, if you are going to the black market and you're trying to convert the rubles into dollars or, or euros, the exchange rate would be, um, you know, around something like around 110, 120, um, you know, rubles for, for a dollar, which is much higher than what we see with the interbank rate. Um, so, but on the other end, you know, there are other things that the Russian government is trying to do by facilitating, you know, um, an alternative um, trading system with other currencies. So uh, you've seen also with uh, regards to payment for, for the gas, um, the Russian government has asked for the payments to be made in rubles. And the same will happen not only with regards to EU gas supplies, but also with the gas supply to India, for example. So this will be essentially, you know, trying to stabilize the ruble and trying to kind of circumvent uh, the ruble's dependence on, um, you know, um, dependency with the EU or the US dollar. This is a, a big, big ask, but do you think Putin would cut off gas if, if places like Germany and France refused to pay in rubles? I, I guess at the moment, the negotiations are, are still ongoing. And, uh, you know, Putin signed this, this decree that um, essentially asks for payments for gas, you know, with unfriendly countries in rubles. So essentially payment scheme that assumes that um, some of your countries will buy, for, you know, gas with rubles, you know, is against the origin original contracts, uh, which have been mainly concluded in dollars and euros. You know, so I think it's again, it, it's kind of a negotiation uh, game at the moment, because on the one hand, you know, yes, potentially the supplies could be cut off. And then essentially it depends on how many reserves, you know, each country has in gas or how quickly, you know, um, the gas uh, purchases can go from a different country, but um, you know, essentially, this is this is a possibility. Yeah, Latvia, for example, is currently considering you know paying for gas in rubles. So there are you know different contractual arrangements for for rich countries. So the outcome of this process is still unknown. The U.S. has released more of its reserves of oil to try and stabilize the price, and Russia has been selling. I think has offered India barrels at $60, which is a lot of a, a huge sort of a huge discount. Um, how will how will that affect oil prices? I mean, it, firstly, with America's reserves, it's I think the third time they've done it since November. How will that affect sort of global oil prices? And how long can they keep doing that for? Yes, yeah, so I guess, you know, there are ways of stabilizing the oil prices by, you know, um, kind of releasing or you know, using some of the reserves that the country have. But I guess in the longer run, you know, that it does sort of impact um, the gas prices, you know, in Europe. And what we've seen also with, with the gas, gas prices generally, you know, the increase in gas prices, you know, no matter from, you know, which supply these, um, you know, the, 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 the gas comes from, you know, they, they are sort of increasing. So I guess what we will see in, in Europe um, and to some extent in the US is, you know, a continuing increase 
of of gas prices because it's, it's just simply you know not possible to control it all the way um, as as reserves will eventually you know uh, thin out. Um, Lith- Lithuania stopped importing Russian gas. Could um, that just flat out stopped? Could um, I mean, could the UK do the same? We only we only we only import three percent of our gas, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be that. I mean, I say it wouldn't be that much. We were talking sort of billions of pounds, but um, it wouldn't be as uh, as hard hitting as say if Germany did it, would it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, among the European countries, you know, UK relies, uh, yeah, you know, for less than ten percent of its total gas supply on Russia. So the UK is definitely the least affected among the European countries, you know, the countries that rely mostly on, you know, the Russian gas apart from CIS countries are, you know, countries like Germany. And, you know, there's been talk in Germany about, you know, stopping the supply of Russian gas. That would be kind of the the last, um, uh, you know, um, counter pressure that uh, the European countries such as Germany could um, could do to the Russian economy. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are some accounts that are uh, being uh, voiced out uh, with regards to, you know, the rising cost of migration from Ukraine. And, you know, if, if the war is continuing, then, you know, the cost of that war, you know, through migration to Germany would be much higher than, you know, the cost of, you know, stopping the supply of cheap Russian gas and, you know, getting it from somewhere else. How much How much would that hurt? I mean, I know it would obviously hurt Putin, um, but I mean, what would what effect would that have if, say, um, Europe came to an agreement tomorrow to stop importing all Russian gas? What would that do to, to Putin and, and to Russia's economy? Well, it, it's really hard to then reorient, you know, the gas supply towards a different economy because, you know, it's not like oil tanks that you can redirect quickly, you know, you have to sort of build the infrastructure to redirect the gas supply to, you know, a different um, country. So, you know, this this would be a huge disruption, um, you know, that would be, you know, costing, you know, billions of dollars to the Russian economy to, to just kind of, you know, even if there was like a trade buyer uh, for this gas supply, you know, it would still not be immediate, you know, uh, redeployment of resources towards somewhere else. So yeah, this is a this is a really critical juncture. Um, it's a big risk. It's a big risk for both sides, then, isn't it? So if we take Germany as the as the main example, it's almost a, it's a, it's a standoff. It's a it's a game. It's a poker game, really, isn't it, between Putin um, and Europe. It's yeah, who who crumbles first? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I guess, you know, um, so far the EU has been, you know, very cautious in uh, taking, you know, uh, even though the sanctions are, you know, the most incredible sanctions um, in history. I mean, Russia is now the most sanctioned country in the whole world. Um, so it's uh, still incredible um, to what extent you know, the EU has been hesitant with, um, you know, some of these aspects. The majority of gas and oil assets in Russia are linked to, to oligarchs through these big state-owned um, providers. Can you just explain what an oligarch is? Oligarch is, um, you know, an ultra-wealthy businessman. Actually, there are only, only men, um, no women, uh, with disproportionate political power. So um, oligarch-owned firms are often structured, you know, as pyramids or through cross holdings, and that's why it's been extremely hard to, you know, uncover, you know, who owns what, you know, in order to be able to, you know, freeze the, their assets. Essentially, after the late 2000, um, you know, when, when sort of Putin decided that um, they, they should be, you know, staying out of politics. The oligarchs are, are kind of, they, they kind of left the political scene. Um, and essentially the, the deal was that, you know, the Kremlin would also stay largely out of their businesses and leave them, you know, um, alone. Officially. 
officially. But yeah, of course, you know, given that their assets are often co-owned uh, with the Russian government, you know, they, their interests are, you know, very closely interlinked. And, you know, the reason for why the UK, the EU, the, the US and, you know, other uh, Western economies have decided to sanction these oligarchs is that, you know, there, there is, of course, um, this back door through which, you know, some of these um, uh, government led initiatives have been financed uh, via the profits from those firms owned by the oligarchs. And uh, so who are they? I mean, are they former associates, former friends of Putin? Does, did, did, does Putin make the oligarchs? Um, or is it, uh, is it more of a meritocracy where people rise to the position of oligarch? Uh, and how many are there? I mean, where, where, do, you, where do you see them in, in, what, in what areas of, of business? So there are sort of different types of oligarchs. So there are around maybe 30 ultra wealthy oligarchs and about, you know, well, maybe 100 to, to 300 individuals with sizable fortunes that were made in the latest years through retail technology and banking. But among the very, very, you know, wealthy oligarchs and, you know, the, the oldest one in terms of their fortunes are those ones that have, you know, received those assets through privatization schemes in the late 90s. And so these oligarchs are primarily in oil and gas, you know, in um, natural resources. Um, and, you know, some of them are in banking. While the kind of the newer uh, oligarchs are more in retail technology and banking. And so the in my view, the more back their wealth is going in time, the most likely they are to be, you know, politically connected to the state. And so, you know, also the more likely is their net worth to be, you know, much, much more important. So among those ones that were sanctions um, by the UK, we have those ones that own you know, huge oil and gas companies and huge um, raw material companies. So that would be, you know, Roman Abramovich, who is the owner of the steel company Evras and also of Norilsk Nickel, Oleg Deribaska, who owns stakes in an energy group, N Plus, and then Igor Sechin from Rosneft, Alexey Miller from Gazprom. So these are all. Um, oil and gas companies, as well as Nikolai Tokarev of Trostneft. And then there are a couple of uh, um, huge banks, big banks, um, such as, you know, um, Andrei Kostin from VTB and Dmitry Lebedev from uh, Bank Russia. And those, those, those that you've mentioned are the one of the seven that have been sanctioned by the UK government. Um, I think the sanctions are worth around 15 billion pounds. But how will that hurt Putin specifically with those those seven those seven individuals? Some of these assets are co-owned by the government, so sanctions would have directive implications for the government finances. Let's say majority of their profits is going to essentially government budgets, you know, and the fact that these assets are frozen, you know, that that would essentially have direct implications and disruptions for the government uh, budget. This is one of the key um, sanctions that, um, you know, the UK governments have imposed, yeah. which would have like exactly direct implications on, on the government uh, budget. Right, thank you, Anna. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll probably invite you back in the future to give us uh, an update on on things that are going on regarding the oligarchs and, and the economy. But um, yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Pete, for having me. You're Have welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. This show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other platforms. I hope you join us again.